I will introduce uh, one of my close friends, one of the people who actually really encouraged me to get in the dark sky field and was always a great mentor to me. Dr. John Barentine uh, is an astronomer, historian, author. Oh, wait, we should we should start streaming now. It's We're we live. We're live. Oh, we've been live for a while. Oh, my gosh. OK, well, hi, hi Facebook. <laughs> um, OK. John, I'm going to get to your bio right now. Uh, John Barentine is an astronomer, historian, author, science communicator, and founder of Dark Sky Consulting, LLC. He earned a PhD in astronomy from the University of Texas at Austin and previously held staff positions at the National Solar Observatory, Apache Point Observatory, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and the International Dark Sky Association, now Dark Sky International. Throughout his career, he has been involved in education and outreach efforts to help increase the public understanding of and support for science. He is a member of the American Astronomical Society and the International Astronomical Union, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. So without further ado, I will pass it over to the Dr. John Barentine, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Betty Maya. It was fantastic. And and um, is, is my audio good? Can everybody hear me all right? Yep, you yes, great. great. Okay. Um, the first thing I'm going to do before I jump into this is I'm going to give you a link in the chat. This is the um, as published version of the report. If you have not seen it yet, it will always live at that URL. So you'll always be able to find it there. You might want to bookmark it if you want to come back to it later. What I'm going to talk to you about are these six things, and I'm, I'm going to try to move through them fairly quickly so there's plenty of time for discussion, uh, question and answer afterward. But I'm going to start with a, a, just a very broad overview of what the report is. Then I'm going to tell you why it's needed. Why is this the kind of document that we hope to put into your hands as advocates? How it was written? What sort of uh, background is there to it? What sources did we use? how the report is structured. And we tried to make the structure as um, meaningful and as sensible as possible so you kind of know what to expect and to, where to go look for the information in the report. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how you can use this, including the ability for you to take the substance of the report and adapt it into your own communications and presentations that you'll make to other groups so that hopefully they can inform your work uh, directly. And then last, I'll, I'll hit on some of the highlights that I think really emerged in the, the uh, scientific literature last year that are important enough to point out. And I'll close with some suggestions for the kinds of questions that researchers might address in the future and where this uh, subject is going as a field of research. So I'm going to start with what the report is. We already did that. You will hear me use the term artificial light at night repeatedly in this presentation, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with what this is, but for anybody that has not encountered it before, I'm just going to briefly tell you what this is. If you hear me use the term Allen, A-L-A-N, that is what it refers to. And what it means is, and there's no exact definition that everybody agrees on, but what it means is light in the nighttime environment that is caused by human beings, that is not naturally present. And it falls largely along two directions that are suggested by these pictures here on the right. The top is the New York City skyline. That's the outdoor Allen situation, which is mostly what we're here to talk about. But there is notably an indoor version of it that is suggested by the picture of the man staring at the uh, computer screen you know, late into the night, which I'm sure many of you have heard that looking at blue light at night is a problem for people. And we will certainly talk about that because that's where a lot of our human health concerns come from. But primarily in this report, we're concerned about artificial light at night in the outdoor context. So what the report is, I would say, is a, an evidence summary. It's intended to be a, a very concise overview of what we know about artificial light at night over these seven broad topical areas. For anybody who has been in the dark sky movement for a while, uh, you will notice that all of the things on here are, are what we're talking about now, and many of them have been our subjects of interest for years. The two at the bottom are the ones that I would say are fairly new. One of them is uh, social and more broadly environmental justice. 
uh, that's only recently come to the fore as a research topic, and there's increasing social awareness of this issue, but also the impact of artificial satellites on the night sky. And that is a very recent phenomenon uh, in terms of it being a, a significant concern. Of course, there have been satellites orbiting the Earth for decades, but there has been a, a rapid increase in the number of those objects orbiting our planet in just the past five years. And it was enough that uh, starting with the, the uh, previous edition of the report, we began treating it as a separate topic uh, and telling you about what we know uh, of how satellites are affecting the night sky. One more poll question I'm going to skip. This is another way of looking at what the report is. Uh, and I've highlighted a few sort of key phrases here. Uh, it's high level. It's not intended to be an exhaustive uh, list of every reference or, or every conclusion of every paper that's out there. But it is an overview that if somebody reads through this, they would have a good grounding in the subject and have an understanding of where the science is on those topical areas that I, I just showed you. It's a compendium of scientific results. Again, we're trying to be fairly comprehensive without being very deep in order to give you an impression of where the field is and point you to references where you can find more information about any of the topics if you want to you know, read the basis for the factual assertions that we make in the report so that you see where those sources are. It's very heavy on primary sources and it's um, extensively documented at the end of the report. It's also our interpretation of the results that are coming from the science that's based on this broad view of the evidence. So what we're trying to do is pull the threads together from all of these different reports and studies that are out there in the literature, find what the common themes are and communicate them in the best way that, that we know how to the broadest possible audience. Um, and lastly, I'd say, uh, because we have an, a section at the end that talks about what the open research questions are, that we've tried to identify what we think are, are the most un, important unsolved problems, the things that we hope researchers will address in the future uh, that are, are um, key uh, missing pieces of information or shortcomings in what we know about the subject. And as you'll see in a moment, it's a very active uh, field of research. It's really coming into its own now. So why is this report needed? What uh, gave us the original impetus to produce this report? Well, there's a few reasons for that. One of them is that the kind of advocacy that we do about light pollution and dark skies necessarily touches on scientific topics. There's just no way uh, around it. There's technical information involved. There is a scientific approach to understanding uh, the problems that we face, and science, I think, as a good vehicle to address those problems. Uh, and it goes back to that um, famous quotation about uh, knowledge is power. And the more that we know about a subject, the more that we're able to effectively advocate for a solution to those problems. We also want to make clear that it's a very fact-based representation uh, in the report about light pollution and what we know and do not know. Uh, and there are still some significant unsolved uh, problems or open questions. We want to come across as being credible. We don't want to be alarmist. Uh, so we want to say what we know with some degree of certainty, but also be upfront about what we don't. Uh, so as to convey a sense of reliable information to the public that they can look back at the report and say, you know, that that is a credible and reliable source of information that I can go back to when I need to, to know something about one of the topics in it. We're trying to also make this information as accessible, timely, and accurate as possible. That's uh, difficult sometimes. The, the topics occasionally are, are very complex, and it takes some energy to put them in ways that are accessible to people. Uh, we want to keep this report up to date rather than it turning into a sort of a dated resource over time. Uh, we want to make it a living document that is uh, regularly reviewed and updated um, for both timeliness and accuracy. And we want to give you useful information so that this isn't just something that sits on a shelf somewhere, but it's something that you can uh, think of ways that you can use in your own advocacy. Um, so wading through all of this technical information 
distilling it down to the most important points and then putting it in accessible language was very important to us uh, in giving you something that we think that you will be able to use. And I know that some of you have already been using it um, in your work and that's, that's very gratifying to see. So now I'm gonna tell you something about the way we put this report together, the actual, the, the method, the mechanics, you know, what sources did we consult, et cetera. And uh, we lean very heavily on something that's called the Artificial Light at Night Research Literature Database, or often termed Allen DB for short. And I have to, I saw uh, Chris Kaiba's name in the attendees roster, and I have to give him a very, very grateful shout out as one of my co-curators of this database uh, who has been doing that work with me for almost a decade. What the database is, is uh, it's on a, built on a platform called Zotero. It's a web-based uh, interface to a database backend. So behind the scenes, there's a database that now consists of nearly 5,000 references in the published literature that extends, if you can believe this, all the way back to the first century. We actually have a, a, a citation in the database from a, approximately the year 70 CE that was a, a reference in classical literature to the observation of um, insects being attracted to the, the flames of oil lamps at night. And it extends all the way up to um, the present day. We are, are adding uh, resources to the database um, frequently uh, in order to keep it up to date. And if you go to this address that you see down there at the bottom, allendb.darksky.org. Um, oh, let me tell you really quick about how uh, rapidly the, uh, the number of papers in the database has been increasing. Here I'm, I'm plotting the total number of references in the database beginning in 2002 uh, for a 20 year timeline, but know that there are references with dates much earlier than this in, in the database as well. But you can see how much that has ramped up just inside that 20 year period. And in fact, in the last 10 years, it's uh, been a very impressive period of growth. Uh, we're adding somewhere between about 400 to 500 references a year to the database right now. Uh, and as more people are interested in this topic and more researchers are entering this field, uh, I expect that's going to continue to go up. So if you go to that address that I showed you a minute ago, uh, allendb.darksky.org, you'll see something that looks like this. And if you've never uh, looked into it before, I encourage you to do so um, because the way this is organized makes the information searchable and very accessible as a result. So you'll see an interface like this if you go to the Zotero site and uh, for each of these items that's in that list, and this is just a tiny fraction of the total number of references that's in the, the database, uh, if you click on any of those titles or, or uh, the fields in the database, over there on the, the right in that otherwise blank space, you'll see the complete bibliographic information for the reference, including a link where you can go and find the source material. There's a search box there at upper right. You can search on keywords that are in titles of papers or their uh, summaries. You can search on author names. You can search on publication names or years. And then um, something that we started very early on that I think has turned out to be um, very helpful to us, even just as the curators, is down there in the lower left of that window, you'll see a number of uh, words and phrases with little colored dots next to them. Those are a series of keywords. And every paper that we add to the database gets at least one of a set of roughly 15 top level keywords that describes the content of the paper. So you can go over there and either search for uh, one of these keywords or you can just click on it and it will uh, instantly limit the display in the window to papers that are tagged with that keyword. And you can do multiple tags in order to find exactly what you're looking for. So I, I encourage you all to take a look at this and to use this if you're looking for information, uh, it will get you very quickly to what you're looking for. So of the papers that are in the database, um, you know, to originally compose this report, we looked at the entire history, going back to the, the very earliest references. Uh, and then in the yearly updates we have done since then, we start with just the previous year's papers. And for 2023, that was a little over 500 items that we added to the database. 
And this pie chart shows you how those break down by numbers. And as we have seen in recent years, the, the top three categories that have the most papers um, have consistently been wildlife, remote sensing, which is a, a broad uh, title that describes the different ways that we collect information about light pollution. Uh, and then human health is a very big concern as well. And you can see some of where the other uh, topics land. Um, some of them are fairly new. As I mentioned, the satellite phenomenon is, is still fairly new to the world of dark skies. And that's an area that is uh, rapidly growing in terms of the number of papers that's being published each year. Um, so as part of our literature review and composing the annual updates, we go through this process of generating a new chart and kind of getting an overview of where the publishing interest in these topics is during the last year. So these are the kinds of sources that we put into the database and that were used in composing the report. We generally tend to prefer studies and reports that have gone through some kind of independent peer review. It is a best practice in science uh, to uh, subject studies to peer review in order to try to improve the quality. We looked at the, the reputation of the publication outlets uh, the ones that we're more familiar with and have a, a more established track record, we gave some preference to. We also looked at the citation rates of these papers. Citation rates, which means the extent to which other authors will cite a study when they write their own papers, is an indication of the academic reputation of a study. Where we had information that was not subjected to third party uh, peer review, we generally avoided it, but not completely. There are just some topics that are so new and have so little published information in any form that we gave some deference to uh, the studies that were not peer reviewed. And those can be things like, for example, uh, uh, masters and PhD theses, where there's an examining committee involved and it's a kind of a form of peer review, but it's not uh, the same as one would get in a journal necessarily. But if we just didn't have any other source about a particular topic, uh, we would consider those as sources. Uh, and then we com compiled together bibliographic information that was as complete as we could make it. So again, if somebody pulls one of these reports years from now, uh, they will be able to know precisely where the information in it came from. And that was something that was very important to us as a matter of credibility. So then there was an analysis that was uh, provided here that we subjected all of these sources to. And as I mentioned earlier, the idea behind the State of the Science Report is in making this information more accessible to pull these threads together, find the common themes in multiple papers on a given subject. Uh, you know, if there's a lot of agreement among studies, we would take note of that. If there was disagreement or tension between studies, we did also took notice of that because that gives us ideas for uh, where are the shortcomings in our information and where do we need to put more of our attention and research in the future. Um, and then we took all of those themes and, and conclusions and we tried to cast a narrative in very plain English language writing in a narrative form. We're avoiding jargon as much as possible where we have to talk about technical terms, we explain them. And, and I even ran this text through uh, some um, AI tools that, not that write the language, but they uh, make suggestions for simplifications, uh, avoiding awkward constructions in English, making the language more uh, accessible. So we used those tools not as a, a means of writing the text, but as a means of refining it in order to improve what they call the readability score uh, and therefore to make this something that more people can access and make use of. So now I'll tell you a little bit about the way that the report is structured so you know what to look for if you're unfamiliar with it. So here's an image of the front page of the report and it's pointing out some of the features that you will find uh, that are unique to the front page and some that will recur elsewhere in the report. And besides the title, right up there near the top is something that is increasingly important in the research world. And that's a thing called a digital object identifier or a DOI. And you'll see right after those letters, DOI, a string of numbers and letters 
that is a unique string that identifies just this report, this version of this report, in fact. And the intent is that those DOI numbers are permanently assigned to objects, which can be reports or data sets or other kinds of published works that follows that published work through its entire life cycle. So you will always be able to locate the report if you know nothing more than its DOI. In the same way, wherever possible, in the list of references, in the bibliography at the end of the report, we endeavored to find the same DOI number for all of the published reports that were included in the summary. So that again, if you have any difficulty finding them, uh, you should be able to locate them by the DOI. And that is true even if, for example, a publisher's website moves items around in its hierarchy. So you go and you bookmark a page for a paper, for example, and you come back a year later and you find that there's nothing there because the publisher has moved it somewhere else on the website. This identifying number will go with it and you'll be able to locate it that way. The report starts with a one paragraph summary that's that bold face paragraph up there in the upper left that uh, describes what the report is and uh, mentions each of the sections. What I'm showing you here is an image from the, the PDF version. And if you are looking at the PDF, you'll see those, uh, some of those items are surrounded. Uh, those numbers have a little red box around them and others have a green box around them. Those are links. So if you click on the, that, uh, that number in that box, it will take you to where that part of the report is. If it's a red uh, box, it means that it's a section header. A green box means that it's a citation. If you click on that, it will take you to the page in the reference list where you can find that citation. So it's a little more user-friendly uh, in that regard. There is a one paragraph introduction immediately after that summary that distills down into about five sentences uh, the essence of the report. It is the very highest level summary of the report's contents. Uh, and it begins to cite some references, but these are, are tend to be uh, very high level review papers. Uh, so if you knew nothing about the topic and you only had the chance to communicate uh, one paragraph of this report to somebody else, I would suggest using that introductory paragraph in the hopes that it will get them interested in the topic and they'll want to read more about it. Earlier, I showed you a slide that had these seven broad subject headers on it, the things like the night sky and wildlife and public safety. Those are the section names in the report and each one is numbered. So uh, you'll see through the report, one through seven are these topical areas. And then in section eight, that's where we review what we think are the open research questions. Each of those uh, top level headers or those section numbers has in a box right below it, you can see there just below where it says the night sky, there's a couple of sentences in italics that are in a box. The box is kind of a summary of the section. Think of it as headlines. If there were just one or two ideas from the section that it's about, uh, the, the most general conclusions in that section, you'll find them in this box. So if you were to take those headlines and you were to string them together, you could condense the report into about two thirds of a page. Uh, and some people have done that as a way of making an even more concise version of the report. And lastly, what I'm pointing out here is the picture at the lower right. We have used illustrations where it makes sense to do so in order to make something clearer that's in the text. Um, there are some very nice graphics that come out of the literature. Uh, we contacted authors about uh, reusing their images in um, the paper, and I think that they add something that's very helpful, um, but also makes the report more visually interesting. We do in-text citations. So that's what I mentioned before with all of the numbers that are outlined in green boxes. Uh, in order to keep the text of the report shorter than it would be otherwise, uh, we don't use the typical academic way of referencing where you would put, for example, the first author's surname and then the year that the report was published or something similar to that. Instead, we just did a sequence of numbers. So every uh, source that we cite has a unique number, and that refers to the order it appears in the citation list at the end. And again, if you're looking at the PDF, 
in a typical PDF viewer, you can click on that number and it will take you to uh, the full uh, citation that's in the bibliography. And then again, there's that final section number eight that's called knowledge gaps and research needs, where as a result of this overview or summary of the evidence, it has pointed out to us uh, questions that we think are not really uh, adequately answered with the current research or they have not been researched at all. And we hope that this is a, a useful guide to people who are researchers in the field to give them ideas uh, for the next things that they might go and uh, dig into with their research. And lastly, there is a methods section at the end that explains the, the way that we put together the report, which is very much along the lines of what I've been talking to you about on the last few minutes. And then there's the beginning of that references section. And because there are now nearly 500 references, this goes on for several pages necessarily. Uh, we've made the references, uh, the citations as compact as possible while retaining all of the information that you need to find these in their uh, original sources. Uh, and in many cases, that is that DOI number, which if you have it, will lead you directly to where that source is published online. So how can you as advocates, as researchers, as lighting industry professionals, et cetera, make use of this uh, report in your uh, work and even in your professional lives? So again, I would say, take a look at that summary. Uh, if, if, again, if there's nothing else that you were to communicate to another person about the report and about the substance of it, I would say it is this summary. It's a, a starting point for conversations uh, that leads into the more detailed sections of the report. So if, if somebody reads this and they're, they're interested in what it talks about and they say, I want to know more about these subjects, uh, it's a, a gateway into uh, the more detailed information in the other sections of the report. Uh, and I think at some level, this is the kind of information that, that guides our advocacy, whether we're speaking to the public or to elected officials or to field practitioners or, or anybody that might be interested in the subject of artificial light at night and light pollution. Again, those headlines in each of the sections are uh, a, a good uh, summary of summaries, as it were. And if you were to put those together uh, in um, just a few paragraphs, uh, you would have a very nice overview of the topic. So you might want to consider taking the headline sections out and reproducing them in different places in your, your advocacy or professional work. The statements in the report, the text of the report, is free for you to adapt uh, for essentially any purpose that you might need it for. Uh, these could be for your presentations. It could be to uh, letters to the editors of newspapers. It could be talking points if you're speaking to uh, elected officials, councils, and legislatures, that sort of thing. Because we've released the text under what's called a Creative Commons license. And it means that as long as you attribute it to the source, so you attribute it to Dark Sky International, um, you can reuse any of the contents for your own purposes. There's one notable exception to that, and that has to do with most of the figures which we are only able to use by permission of the uh, creators of those images, and they are typically copyrighted. Um, so if you were to want to use one of the images, we would encourage you to contact the authors of the papers that they are taken from and request permission. Oftentimes they will grant you that permission, uh, but just know that Dark Sky International uh, doesn't have the authority to give other people the right to reproduce. But the text is all ours. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to use it as you see fit. And um, one way that you can use the report in its entirety is to provide either an electronic copy or a hard copy to groups that you visit, for example, elected officials and particularly their staff. You may only have a few minutes to meet with uh, your local counselor uh, or your parliamentary representative or whoever it is you're speaking to, but you very well may have more time to speak to their staff members. And at that, it still may only be a few minutes. And so it, it's useful to have this at the ready if they ask you for more information uh, that you can provide it to them or follow up with them and provide an electronic copy uh, and give them a little description of what it is. And don't be surprised if they actually do read it or read sections of it and come back to you with questions. 
So um, in the last few minutes here, before we open it for Q&A, I want to talk about what I think are some of the um, important highlights from the past year, some things that are, are either new or things that we are learning more about that are of particular interest right now, uh, and that are things that you may want to dig into more yourselves. And the first of those has to do with this, this broad area that I referred to earlier as remote sensing. And what that means is any uh, means or method by which we make measurements of, in this case, light pollution or artificial light at night from some distance. So instead of um, you know uh, being at the source of the light, we're looking at it from uh, orbit around the Earth, or we're looking at it from high altitude, as in the case of the example shown there on the left. Uh, and we're making images of the Earth at night with increasing detail in order to be able to understand both how light at night is distributed on the Earth but also some of its characteristics, like how frequently the lights are on or off or what sort of color characteristics they have. And in addition to Earth orbiting satellites, which have been imaging the night side of the Earth for about 50 years, we now increasingly have these sophisticated camera packages that are being uh, borne aloft by either uh, high altitude balloons, like in this case, uh, uh, the, the uh, research group that's uh, led by Martin Bay at the University of Sherbrooke in Canada puts a camera package on a weather balloon and sends it up into the stratosphere where it takes hours to drift over uh, a, an area of interest on Earth. And it just continually takes images while it's drifting over. And we get these very detailed images from Earth orbit, we can achieve a resolution with civilian technology of a few tens of meters, perhaps, uh, but they can get roughly meter resolution with this method. There are people that are using um, drone aircraft, or sometimes called UAVs, that fly at a lower altitude, and they're getting even better resolution. They're able to fly up very close to the light sources and make detailed observations of them, for example. And this is something that has just been revolutionized in recent years. And there are several papers like this that were published in 2023 showing these just unprecedented images of the Earth at night. We're also starting to get information from remote sensing about the nature of the lights that are being observed, and in particular, um, their spectral characteristics. So what I'm showing you on the right is uh, a paper that produced some interesting results last year based on satellite images of the Earth. In this case, they used one of the most famous places on Earth for light pollution, that being the Las Vegas Strip here in Nevada in the United States. And the, the, uh, of that pair, the image on the, the left is a daytime image where the red overlays show some particular uh, lighting installations that they identified in their nighttime images. And one of those nighttime images is shown on the right. The advance here is uh, there is a capability in this particular satellite that was used to measure low resolution spectra of the light sources so they can break up the light into its constituent colors. And whether certain colors are brighter or, or dimmer tends to reveal something about the nature of the light source. So the color coding in that image on the right tells us about the kinds of lights that are installed, whether they're uh, different varieties of LED or sodium lights, which is a somewhat older technology, uh, other technologies like incandescent lighting, uh, metal halide, et cetera. Uh, and that's something that we didn't really have a lot of information about before. If you look at the, again at the picture with the balloon on the left, the image of the city that's in the upper right corner, the colors are fairly warm. They're sort of a golden or orange color, and that's indicative of sodium light. Uh, but that's only a sort of a first order guess as to what kinds of lights are there with these new satellite capabilities that now have a good combination of resolution on the ground, but also the spectral sensitivity, we're able to say what kinds of lighting technologies are used in different installations. And as we watch this evolve over time, it's giving us some helpful information that we can then take back to uh, the, the local government authority, for example, that uh, regulates lighting in a place like Las Vegas and make a better case for the kinds of regulations that we might want to see based on this ground truth data we're getting from the satellites. We're also beginning to get a good handle on the impact of artificial light at night on the biological world, and in particular, how it is harming biodiversity. 
This um, infographic on the left is from a paper that was part of a series published in a special issue of an esteemed British journal called Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Uh, they did this special issue with half a dozen or so review papers last year that were um, a very helpful overview of what's going on, particularly with the biological aspects of artificial light at night. And something that stood out to me in the literature review was how we're starting to get an idea of how uh, Allen is affecting whole communities of organisms. Pretty much every species that we look at, uh, where we're studying it for the effects of Allen, we see an impact and it's usually adverse. It's, it's a negative impact because Allen interferes with a lot of uh, different biological processes and activities in individual organisms. But it's only in recent years that we've started backing up to see this bigger picture that involves the way species interact. And in particular, um, the way that the, the, the ecological uh, sum of all of those interactions is being impacted by Allen. So what they're showing in this diagram, it's sort of the ways that uh, the effects of Allen are filtering down through these topical areas of interaction between species. And in particular, what stood out to me here was this paper talked about how the interactions between species are, as they put it, being rewired. So there are uh, species moving into new biological niches that they didn't occupy before, sometimes displacing the ones that are already there. Uh, interactions between species are changing, which are uh, to a competitive advantage for some and a disadvantage for others. And the, the, the biodiversity aspect of this is, is really important, especially in regard to the way it interacts with global climate change, which is putting a lot of stress on uh, plant animal species all over the world. Um, it may not be the thing that causes any particular species to become endangered or even go extinct, but it is another stressor that is pushing some of those species towards the brink of extinction. In the world of health research, we're finding out more about the ways that artificial light at night uh, is affecting us as human beings, because we, of course, are part of the biological world. Uh, as I mentioned towards the top of the presentation, a lot of this comes from uh, Alan in indoor context in particular. There's a lot we don't know about the way that artificial light at night um, interacts with human health when it comes from outdoor sources. But we know that in many cases that outdoor light is making its way into indoor spaces. Uh, and that's where all bets are off. Uh, and especially if we're talking about low level exposures over many years that can cause chronic health problems, there's an increasing evidence basis uh, to believe that. But again, a lot of this comes from laboratory studies in controlled circumstances. And one that was really prominent in the literature last year, there were several papers about this, the way that artificial light at night seems to be affecting older people through uh, what are termed neurodegenerative diseases. That means uh, conditions with brain health that are negative in terms of uh, what they do to our ability to, to, uh, to think, to reason, uh, to perceive the world around us. And that's most commonly encountered in the form of diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And this uh, particular result that I'm highlighting here, um, the, this little flow chart kind of that they've developed identifies uh, disruption of the human circadian rhythm by light at night exposure as uh, a source that sets off a cascade of uh, disruptions in the body that have to do with brain health. And in particular in Alzheimer's disease, which is understood to be the result of a buildup of, a, of an abnormal kind of protein in the brain, it looks like a healthy circadian rhythm is really key to not only limiting the production of this protein, but also encouraging the system by which the protein that does occur in the brain is removed. And that if we disrupt the circadian rhythm, we sort of short circuit both of those pathways. Again, this may not be the influence that on its own causes somebody to have Alzheimer's disease or develop dementia, as that's a that's a complex topic and there are many influences that, that result in that outcome. But we can say with increasing confidence that exposure to artificial light at night is probably one of those contributing factors. And that in turn is suggesting uh, both potential treatment options, but also think about older people who are in managed care facilities. 
uh, practitioners should be looking out for their circadian health as much as for other aspects of their physical health. And it may limit uh, the ultimate incidence of diseases like Alzheimer's, which is expected to uh, affect an astounding number of people in the world in coming years as the human population continues to age. Something that's still fairly new to us is the way that light pollution and artificial light at night is interacting with outdoor air quality. We've known for some time that in places where there's a lot of air pollution, especially uh, particulate pollution, which is very tiny particles suspended in the air that mostly comes from sources like automobile exhaust or industrial production, that that will have the tendency of brightening the night sky because those particles are very good at scattering light back to the ground. But we're also increasingly seeing evidence that the artificial light at night going up into the night sky is interacting with the chemistry of the air and changing that chemistry in ways that might make air quality worse. I'm showing you a, another sort of infographic here that conveys the result that was published in this paper last year about uh, the ways that light pollution on the ground may be changing uh, the ways that ozone and nitrate, which are two well-known air pollutants, are ordinarily removed from the air at night by natural processes in the, the chemistry of the air. So those um, molecules are formed on the daytime side of the earth because of interaction of sunlight with the atmosphere. And at night, ordinarily, those molecules interact with other kinds of constituents of the atmosphere and they're neutralized or they're removed from, uh, from the picture. But it's possible that at least at a small level that artificial light at night is preventing those interactions from taking place and may result in higher concentrations of those molecules the following day. And that has implications for public health because we know those molecules are detrimental to people. Again, this is a small result. It's a couple of percent. But, you know, that's something that we should probably keep an eye on because it may be more significant in the future if there's more artificial light on the ground. And, uh, and again, in the interest of, art of, of uh, public health, we should do everything we can to try to limit the uh, amount of these molecules that remain in the atmosphere and one way to do that would be to limit light pollution. Um, and then the, the satellite issue that I've mentioned a couple of times is one where we're learning an awful lot. Um, and for as much as we learn, there are new questions or, or new concerns that come up um, that make this um, an increasingly acute topic in the field of dark skies. Um, one result that was published last year, it was more sort of a theoretical study, had to do with the Earth's magnetic environment, which is suggested by the figure over there on the left. Those blue loops that are surrounding the little cartoon picture of the Earth are um, the so-called Van Allen belts, which the magnetic field traps uh, energetic particles around the Earth naturally. But now we're putting satellites into this region. And as they collide with each other, as they shed debris into these spaces, there is the possibility that um, that material will add to the radiation belts and may even trigger geomagnetic events where we start to see the aurora more frequently. If anybody saw the amazing rural display a couple of weeks ago over much of the, the world, um, that was a distinctly natural phenomenon. But there are some possibilities now that we may be artificially enhancing that. And although the, the, the aurora is natural light, uh, if it is something that's more frequent, um, it's another factor in the nighttime environment that's ordinarily not there, especially at lower latitudes. So this is a topic that's worth watching. And with new uses of satellites in space, we're finding uh, instances where uh, new satellites are coming about that are increasingly large and they're very large and uh, efficient reflectors of sunlight. This is a picture on the right of the brightness of a prototype satellite called Blue Walker 3 that was deployed a couple of years ago by a company that is intending to provide cell phone coverage from the ground to this satellite. And this prototype is about the size of a tennis court when its antenna is completely unfurled. And what the plot is showing you is that for a time, other than the sun, the moon, and some of the brighter planets, this was one of the brightest objects in the entire night sky. So that vertical axis there that says range corrected V magnitude, all you need to know about that is that as those numbers get smaller and eventually negative, that means a very bright thing. And at its brightest, Blue Walker 3 attained a magnitude of about zero. 
which is consistent with some of the brightest stars in the night sky. It wasn't bright for very long. It was only certain parts of its orbit. Uh, but it's concerning if, if we face a future in which there may be dozens or hundreds of objects this size or bigger orbiting the Earth. Uh, and this is still a very contentious topic right now. There's not a lot of regulatory oversight. And uh, I think we're headed into a very uncertain future with all of this. So lastly, I said I would give you a sense of some of the, the key topics that are uh, open questions. What are the things that we want to know that we, we don't have answers to right now? And these are just a few of the uh, questions that we ask in the, the last section of the report that are things to think about and keep an eye on for the future, as I hope that we will have research results in the future that address these topics. Um, some of them are, are themes that you've heard of. You know, where, where are the light emissions in the world coming from? Why do they seem to be increasing so much? What are the long-term ecological consequences of all of this? Is it driving some species in the direction of extinction? How does it interact with global climate change? What do we need to find out about the ways humans are affected by outdoor sources of light at night in terms of their physical and mental health? Um, how can we design light better? What's the minimum amount of light that we can use that's safe? So we knew, know that people can move about at night safety safely uh, without producing an excess of light pollution? And can we use things like adaptive controls effectively in order to, in a way that's in keeping with the five principles for responsible outdoor lighting, make sure that that lighting is on when it needs to be and provided in the right amount and otherwise is dimmed or turned off altogether. So that's all I have to present to you. I'm gonna leave my contact information up here on the, the um, screen for a moment. If you wanna contact me, I would love to hear from you. Uh, follow me on social media if you're interested in that sort of thing. If you have questions about the report, please do get in contact. Uh, otherwise, I thank you for your attention and I will be glad to take your questions. Amazing, John, as always, thank you so much for this incredible, incredible resource. Just really watching this presentation. Basically, I've been in awe the whole time. Um, like I know how much work goes into it, but really hearing you spell it out and seeing all the papers and the work and the citations, uh, it's truly incredible and useful and imperative for all of us to have this resource. So thank you so much for all of your work and putting this together and your really great presentation um, for the advocates today. I know a lot of people here in the chat are saying some lovely things as well. There was one here, John says, we, were, we will always be grateful to Dr. John Barentine for helping us establish the first IDA Star Park in the Southeastern US over 10 years ago. So John, you're just a legend and we're so happy to have you here. And thank you for being a continued part of, of the work for Dark Skies. So there are a lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna start, maybe I'll like clump them together. There's a couple here kind of just about the the report in general. So um, Todd asks, is there a process for advocates to contribute to the Allen database? So like, is there a way everyone here today can help flag these reports for you and send them to you and get them onto this database? Yeah, Todd, that's a, uh, I'm glad that you asked about that. There are ways that you can do that. Um, I'm a curator. Uh, Chris Kive is a curator. If you were to get in touch with us about um, papers that you find that are not in the database in particular, and definitely if you have something, check to see if it's already listed. Uh, and many times it will be. Um, I, I rely on things like uh, setting Google alerts through Google Scholar. So I see a lot of what gets published that has certain keywords in it, but we miss things sometimes. And if you have a resource that you think might be appropriate for the database, but you don't find already listed there, um, please get in touch with us. Uh, either send us an email, send me a message. I'm on the advocate Slack. And if it's not there, we'll make sure to get it added. Um, and when we do, we'll look at it very carefully to make sure that it meets all of our criteria for inclusion. Um, but sometimes we just miss things. And so we'd be grateful if you would help point those out to us. Thanks, John. Laura has a, a good question about getting access to these papers, right? Are all of the papers that are on the Allen database accessible to anyone without having to pay or are some of them behind paywalls? 
Oh, Laura, I have bad news for you. <laughs> and that <laughs> and that is an ongoing problem in academic publishing, which is many of the papers that you will find on uh, in the database and cited in the report are behind paywalls. There's not a great way around that other than I can tell you that it is um, quite often the case if there's a paper that you're really interested in but you cannot otherwise obtain, if you contact the authors, so look in that author list at the front, uh, there will be contact information for at least one of them. If you send that author a message and say, I saw your, your uh, listing for your paper, I'm you know, otherwise unable to obtain a copy, would you send me one? 99% of the time, they will say yes to you, and they will send you a, a PDF copy of their paper. They're allowed to do that. It doesn't break any rules with copyright. Uh, so if you find something you're interested in, definitely um, contact the authors. Um, it's hard to tell from the reference list what is and, and is not paywalled. Uh, I hope in the future we'll find a, a, a long-term solution to this because I believe all scientific research should be free to everyone. Uh, but right now we're just dealing with the reality of the world being the way that it is. Yeah. Thank you, John. And I've seen a lot of questions today in the chat about like, where do I find this report? Like people, now people know how to find the database, but I think we're a little bit confused about where to find the report exactly. So I just posted, if you go to darksky.org, we have a blog, our most, one of our most recent blog posts is all about the state of the science. Um, and that report is also linked on that blog post. It also was in the email inviting you to this uh, meeting. And I think we will also send out another, potentially another email with like the recording and the link again. Uh, but it does live on darksky.org. And I have shared um, also the direct link to the Zenodo um, report just right now in the chat. And I will also just pop the blog post in there again one more time. Uh, so that's how you find this awesome report. And we are like reaching the top of the hour. Maybe I'll ask a couple more questions before we go into um, breakout rooms for networking, just because there are so many great questions. Um, I think Guillermo Blanc asked a really great question here. He says, hi, John, it looks like the fraction of papers being published regarding public safety is very small, but in our experience and in my experience, public safety is the main concern that citizens and authorities have when thinking about light pollution control. And as the report states, there's mixed evidence in the literature for the relation between light and crime. Do you see this as a problem and why is there not a more active research in this area? Uh, well, first, I, got, I have to give a shout out to Guy. He's a, 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 a very old friend. Um, I'm glad for that question. And your perception is absolutely right. And, and, and we're very direct about that in the report, that there is uh, the evidence about lighting and, and public safety, in particular about the way outdoor lighting and crime uh, incidents are related to each other, is very unsettled. The, the results are, are, are mixed. Um, there's no, what the health researchers would call a dose response relationship. So although there may be some pieces of evidence in the literature that applying outdoor lighting seem to have a, a beneficial effect on reducing crime, we don't know how much light produces what kind of response. It does not seem to be consistent at all. And there are cases that it goes the other direction where adding light to a situation uh, made crime worse or reducing lighting levels actually made crime levels seem to decrease. Um, so there's, there's no formula that tells us how to do this. It is a, a difficult uh, reality in confronting this issue when you're talking to people, especially in government and in elected office, because they, they would like there to be very simple answers to these questions, but the reality is that there uh, is just not. Uh, what compounds this is that it's difficult to get the funding to do the crime studies, the, the, the traffic studies, et cetera. Um, oftentimes, when uh, researchers do get that funding, um, it comes from sources like lighting companies. And not to say that they can't do uh, very objective research, but the, the, the source will always be a concern at some level. Uh, and then just designing good, repeatable studies 
uh, on these what amount to sort of social science topics is very difficult. And to be honest, there are some crime studies out there that are really not well designed and conducted, and it's difficult to interpret the results. So I wish I had better news, but that of all of these topics that are in the report, I think that's the one that's sort of most controversial. And next to human health, it's also the one where the, the uh, evidence is so unsettled. Thanks, John. Um, I like this question from Michael. As advocates, we're very solutions oriented, right? So can you just speak a little bit about like what the report touches on in terms of mitigation measures? Like what is effective for us to be focusing on as advocates in what has been researched as an effective measure to reduce light mm -hmm. pollution? I would say two things about that. One of them is we don't actually have a lot of mitigation studies where the intent was to go and systematically uh, investigate a mitigation technique and show what sort of result it produced. I think you can infer from many of the studies that the kind of approach that is taken in the five principles for responsible outdoor lighting, um, that approach is the one that is likely to produce the best results as mitigations. And by mitigations, we mean making changes to existing lighting or sometimes changes to design of lighting before it is ever installed with the intent of ensuring that it will not cause more light pollution or for lighting that already exists, that we can reduce its impact as much as possible. So what we get from many of these studies, whether it's health or wildlife or social justice, is that when we reduce wasted light, we better target it to the human needs and reduce the instances where it's lighting up places that the, the light isn't required or isn't needed, looking at things like the timing, the duration of the lighting at night, the spectrum of the light. When we do those things, we seem to see better results that are implied by these studies. But that's what I would say is, is one of those open questions. And I I've identified it a little bit right there at the end is, which of those things produces the best result? We don't know. We kind of think it's a combination of all of them, that you really cannot take any one of the five principles in isolation from the others. But even if all we got was a reduction in the amount of unshielded lighting, for example. We just limited the light to where it needed to be on the ground. Right away, that would have beneficial effects in all these areas. But it would be nice to see it studied systematically. So if somebody asks us, well, what evidence do you have that that actually produces the result that you claim it does, that we would be able to show them some data. Right now, it's a little bit more uh, of um, an anecdote type basis rather than there being hard data about the uh, efficacy of these different mitigation strategies? Good question. Thank you, John. And I will just do one more question from Deborah. There are a lot of questions that we did not get to, but I really want to give you guys time to meet each other and network. So uh, I think Deborah's question is one that I also have and struggle with because um, this topic is just so broad. But if you met someone unfamiliar with these issues and had one minute to tell them why dark skies are important, what would you say? Um, Deborah, I think about this all the time and, and I have to do this regularly in my work. And I would say that we live on a planet that is being stressed nearly to the breaking point. And that one thing that we can do that is easy, simple, and cost-effective, and we have all this evidence for, is to reduce the amount of light pollution in the world because it is a win, win, win. We consume less electricity. We have a lower environmental and carbon footprint as a result. We take some stress off of biological systems uh, and the world really needs a win right now. I, I tell this a lot to people, whether it's public or journalists, et cetera, the world needs a win. Uh, we live in a, a very dangerous time right now. We need that win. This is an easy problem to solve. Uh, and we know that when we attempt the solutions, we're, we have a high degree of confidence that it works. That's my less than one minute pitch for why dark skies are important. Beautiful. I love I love the win, win, win. I feel like that always goes over well with everybody. We love a win, 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 win situation. So uh, light pollution and dark skies give us that. So, uh, well, there's a ton of questions we didn't get to. I'm so sorry to everyone who's 
uh, whose questions we did not answer. Um, but this is a great opportunity to, you know, potentially reach out to John, stay in contact with John. He's very active on the Advocate Slack. So let's bring these questions over to the Dark Sky Advocate Network Slack. But I would like to close out again with just a huge thank you to John Barentine. A huge thank you to everyone who attended today. And I will leave it to John to share any last words with us. Thanks for having me once again. Um, keep an eye on this space because our intent is to keep this going in the future and do an annual update and do these presentations and try to keep you all as um, informed as possible to make your advocacy as effective as it can be. So thanks for having me today. Thank you.